Uh, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to ORT 133, Language and Literature. Today we are going to go through levels of linguistic analysis and the basic genres of literature. My name is Johanna Makede John from the Open University of Tanzania. Uh, these are the contents of module number five. We shall look at the levels of linguistic analysis through which we shall see the phonographological level and the lexical semantic level and the semantic, the, the syntactic level. Then we shall look at the aspect of foregrounding in a text. And lastly, we shall see the basic genres of literature and their elements. So we shall look at the forms of literature, the elements of prose, the elements of poetry, and the elements of drama. Uh, beginning with the levels of linguistic analysis, uh, here we shall see the phonographological level, the lexical semantic level, and the syntactic level. Uh, to begin with the phonographological level, the systemic functional grammar developed by M.A.K. Halliday recognizes phonology and graphology as levels of language substance. Phonology deals with the phonic substance, that is, segmental and suprasegmental units of language, while graphology deals with the graphic substance. This section will expose you to those things that, are, that should be considered in doing a stylistic analysis at the phonographological levels of language description. Yeah, to begin with the phonograph, uh, uh, phonograph, phonographological level, Phonographology, as a term, was popularized by Halliday 1961 in explicating a number of different levels at which linguistic events should be accounted for within this framework. Halliday 1961, page 243 to 44, observes that the primary levels are form, substance, and content. According to him, the substance is the material of language, that is phonic, audible noises, or graphic, that is visible marks. Hence, phonographology is the organization of substance into meaningful events. The context relates the form to know linguistic features of the situation in which language operates to yield extra textual features. Therefore, systematic functional linguistics recognizes the formal and the situational dimensions of language description. Working within this tradition, Leach and Short, 1981, identify four levels of language description, which are syntax, semantics, phonology, and graphology. Syntax and phonology form the expression plane and interact to bring out meaning, which is the preoccupation of semantics. According, according to them, Graphology is an alternative form of realization to phonology. Although phonological features can be said to be remote in a written text, they are still not irrelevant 
After all, a text is written to be read or spoken. Spelling can be exploited to suggest some phonological features, and these will be more prominent when the text is read aloud. Phonologically, the analysis of language at this level involves the basic sound units such as the combination of sounds, stress, tone, and patterns of intonation. What are the segmentals? The segmental units of English consist of at least 20 vowels and 24 consonants. The 20 vowels are made up of 12 pure vowels and 8 diphthongs. Also, the 24 consonants are made up of 15 voiced and 9 voiceless consonants. Refer to the basic knowledge of these segmental units. Note that writers, especially poets, can exploit the sounds and their structures to achieve special effects. For example, through the use of alliteration, through the use of assonance, and so on. Let us look at the supra segmentals. These are the units that are larger than the segmentals. That's why they're called supra. They are larger than the segmentals. Stress, as an example, is a supra segmental unit. It refers to the degree of force or loudness with which a syllable is pronounced. It can also indicate a word class as in the present for a noun. Sorry. It can also indicate a word class as in the present for noun and present for verb. Object meaning a noun an object as a verb. Intonation, which is another supra segmental unit, indicates primarily the falling or rising pitch of a word or sentence, as in the following examples. Look at these two. Look at these two senses. He has come. And he has come. The first one, he has come, ends with a falling intonation, he has come. And the second one, he has come, ends with a rising intonation. Now note, the falling intonation in the first sentence above indicates a statement while the rising intonation in the second sentence indicates a question. The combination of stress and intonation gives the English language its, pe its peculiar rhythm and writers, especially poets, utilize heavily this feature of the language to achieve some effects in their writings. Let's look at graphology. <coughs> at this level, such things, such things as spelling, punctuation, space management, underlining, use of picture, coloring, etc. are considered and analyzed. The patterns of writing can also indicate the variety of language involved. Example words like color and meter are classified as American English based on their spellings. If you look at the spellings of the word color and the word meter, they are classified as American with regard to their spellings. Conversely, there are varieties, color, color and meter, are regarded as British, are regarded as British English for the same reason. Graphological elements are often used to achieve foregrounding in the text. 
Foregrounding simply means at making certain elements in a text prominent so as to attract attention. Any aspect of a text that is foregrounded is made conspicuous to attract the reader's attention. Let us look at the lexical semantic level. The lexical semantic level is the level at which a stylistic analyst looks at the author's deployment of words and their meanings in a text. According to Mil Milkia 2000, page 339, the study of lexis is the study of the vocabulary of the language in all its aspects. And as Ajudo 1994, page 1 to 8, says, many linguists have started to develop interest in lexical studies in English, perhaps as a result of the realization that there is a need for a separate level on linguistic analysis to cater for certain linguistic patterns and regularities which the grammatical level alone can take care of for. <coughs> Let's look at semantics. Semantics is the study of the linguistic meaning of morphemes, words, phrases, and sentences. And subfields sub of semantics are lexical semantics and structural semantics. Lexical semantics is concerned with the meaning of words and the meaning of syntactic units rather, rather than the word. Roman Jacobson, as quoted by Frankin Italy 2003, says, Language without meaning is meaningless. Semantics is the philosophical and scientific study of meaning. It can also be said to be a branch of linguistics which is preoccupied with the study of meaning. We need to note this, it's very important, that semantics helps us to understand the nature of language because it accounts for the abnormalities experienced when reading English senses, such as, consider these three senses here. The chicken ate the man. My cat read English. A dress was walking to the door. Think of the meanings of these senses. The abnormality in each of these senses above is not noticed in its syntax because it addresses to the same basic syntactic rule, such as the plate kicked the man. The plate kicked the man. This is the noun phrase, and this is the verb phrase, and the last one is the noun is the noun phrase. The chicken ate the man. It is in the same syntactic pattern. Noun phrase, the chicken ate the verb, and Noun phrase, the man. My cat read English in the very same syntactic pattern. And a dress was walking to the door. Hence, each of the senses is grammatical. In terms of grammatic, grammaticality, the senses are grammatical. But they have something wrong with their semantics. What about Lexis? Lexis describes the entire storage of words and the expressions in a language. The term lexicon derives from the root word Lexis and it refers to the list of the possible words in a language. From Kim et al. 2003 asserts that one of the important ways of representing semantic properties is by the use of semantic features. These are formal and notational devices that indicate 
the presence or absence of semantic properties by pluses and minuses. Words fulfill certain roles within the situation described by the sentence. These have been identified as agents or subjects, theme or object, and instrument or predicate. Further functions of, of noun phrases in a sentence include experiencer, location, source and goal, among others. Look at these examples. Look at the following examples. Number one. Say, saw a mosquito on the wall. Say, saw a mosquito on the wall. And she hit the mosquito with a stick. And she handled the mosquito to me. Beginning with the first sentence. Say saw a mosquito on the wall. Say it is the experiencer. Mosquito is the theme. And on the, all, on the wall is the location where the mosquito is. Sentence number two. She hit the mosquito with a stick. She is the agent who did the, act, the sentence action of hitting. The mosquito and the mosquito is the theme and with a stick refers to the instrument that is used to hit the mosquito so she agent mosquito theme and with a stick instrument and sentence number three she handled the mosquito to learn she is the agent the doer of the sentence action the mosquito is the theme, and to Mary is the goal. Let's talk a little bit about lexical semantics. The main argument of the lexical semantists is that if the word is an identifiable unit of language, then it must be possible to isolate a cause table meaning that enables its consistent use by a vast number of users in different situations. Linguists have attempted to unravel meanings of lexical items based on their componential features. The task involved is what is known as componential analysis, which is a byproduct of lexical composition. That is, the process of analyzing lexical features. Semantics believes that words are decomposable into primitive meanings which can be represented by markers such as plus and minus matrices. For instance, think of the word spinster. When spinster may have the following component, componential features. Spinster is human, yes. Spinster is female. Spinster is mature. Spinster is single, not married. The plus simply means the presence of a trait and the minus simply means absence of the trait. So, spinster means human, female, matured, single. Thus, words can be broken down into their distinctive semantic features in order to describe what they mean. Somebody doing a stylistic analysis at the lexical semantic level can use the lexical features of a text to describe how words are used to mean in the text. <clears throat> Let us look at lexical relations. Your money to the study of lexis is the semantic field theory which holds that 
The meanings represented in the lexicon are integrated because they cluster together to form fields of meaning which in turn metamorphose to a larger field of entailment. The cycle con continues until the total language is encompassed. The issue of lexical relations is closely related to the notion of semantic field. Beyond 1977 and late 1981, view basic or primitive semantic relations as synonymy, antonymy, and hyponymy. Synonym refers to similarity of meanings. This is the relationship between go and proceed, similarity in meanings. Antonymy suggests oppositeness, that is oppositeness in terms of meaning. It also denotes conversness for the reversible relationship between husband and wife, male and female. This is what Lich 1981, page 102, calls relative opposition. Hyponymy is the relation of inclusion. For instance, the word flower will have the following co-hyponyms. Rose, rose is a flower. Hibiscus is a flower. So the two words, rose and hibiscus, are included in the meaning flower. Let's look what denotative meanings. I must have said about this in the previous module, modules, but still I repeat. Denotative meaning refers to the conceptual meaning of a word. It is the plain or central meaning of a word. It is this type of meaning that is easily expressed in terms of componential features. For example, the denotative meaning of man can be expressed in terms of human, adult, non-female. That is, a man is human, a man is adult, but a man is not female. The denotative meaning of a word is said to be its literal objective meaning. What about the connotative meaning? <coughs> I also talked about this in the previous modules, but I better repeat my emphasis. Connotative meaning is a kind of additional, suggestive, personal, or cultural meaning. Connotation can be regarded as a subjective meaning. Connotatively, a woman can be regarded as a man to suggest that she has the attributes of a man. Connotation points to the associative or figurative dimension of word meanings. This feature is of particular significance in poetry, where poets use words not only for their literal meanings, but also for what they suggest. Also, we should note the use of such figures of speech as metaphors, personification, simile, hyperboles, and others. Let's look at idiomatic meaning. What is an, idioma, an idiomatic meaning? In describing language at the lexical semantic level, your knowledge of the idiomatic meanings will be of relevance. Idioms are special collocations, the meaning of which cannot be determined from the meanings of the elements that make them up. The meaning of an idiom has to be learned as that of an individual lexical item. For example, take, take these idioms, take these idioms to rain cats and dogs, to hold a bull by the horn, to let a sleeping dog die. If you interpret, if you seek for the meaning of these idioms, depending on the meanings of individual words composing these idioms, you won't get the right meaning. You need to study the meanings of these idioms as if you study, as if you are studying the meanings of individual words. 
You know what these idioms mean? You should go and make a poem. The meanings of those idioms. You need to know this. Apart from their literal contexts, words can also have idiomatic contexts. And language users like literary artists often exploit these when they communicate. As you have learned, words have a way of combination that may be fixed or free. When it is fixed, we have an idiomatic expression. The syntactic level of text analysis, the syntactic level, level of text analysis. One important level of linguistic analysis is the syntactic level. At this level, just like any other level of, of language description, significant statement of meaning can be made based on the observation of the choices that a writer or speaker has made and, of course, the genre, literature, or the genre of literature, or the peculiarities of the text involved. <clears throat> Let's see the aspect of units of grammar. Language is a structural entity as its elements exist and function in a hierarchical order. Such units or elements include morpheme, word, group or phrase, clause and sentence. The morpheme is the smallest unit while the sentence is the highest or the largest unit. You need to note that in order to do a stylistic analysis at the syntactic level, you should be familiar with the group of phrase, the clause and the sentence, among other relevant syntactic elements. There is an important aspect called the foregrounding. What is foregrounding? Foregrounding refers to the concept of making certain features prominent in a text. You can do that by a number of ways. Some linguistic features can be made prominent for special effects against the background features in a text. Scholars have examined the term as used in the literal enterprise as being for purely aesthetic exploitation of language, which has the aim of making what is familiar and familiar in order to attract attention. The concept of deviation is closely related to that of foregrounding in that what is foregrounded is made to deviate from the familiar pattern. And so, one can decide to to foreground a word either by changing the normal order of the sentence structure or by italicizing or by bolding and several other ways as we shall see later. What is the purpose of foregrounding? The purpose of foregrounding linguistic or non-linguistic is to add an unusual and unique idea to the language. Thus, foregrounding can manifest in various ways, can be manifested through various ways in a text, like unusual capitalization, italicization, bolding, use of contractions, underlining, picture or artworks, and so on. Those are some of the common ways that are used to show foregrounding. We can say that the use of these foregrounding devices creates some visual imagery which, add, which adds the memorability of a text. Let's see the types of foregrounding. According to Wells, 1989, page 182, Foregrounding can be achieved in a variety of ways, usually grouped into two main types, deviation and repetition. That is paradigmatic and syntagmatic foregrounding. 
Wales explains further that deviations are violations of linguistic norms. For example, grammatical or semantic norms, strange metaphors, similes, or collocations that are deployed to achieve special effects in a text, especially poetry, amount to foregrounding. Look at these lines. Look at these lines from Okara's New Year's Eve Midnights. A year is born, and my heart bell is ringing. A year is born, and my heart bell is ringing. Here, a year is said to be born. In the first sentence, a year is said to be born. And a bell is said to be ringing in the poet's heart, and my heart, my heart bell is ringing. You can think of this. Think of this before we go to the next. A year is born, and my heart, my heart bell is ringing. Is it possible for a year to be born? Read not possible. And can and can your heart possess a bell that rings? That's also impossible. Syntactically, the senses are, are grammatically okay, but semantically there is a form of deviation for artistic purposes. Now let's look at repetition. Repetition is also said to be a kind of deviation as it flows the normal rules of usage by overfrequency. Wales, 1989, page 182, says so. Repetition of sounds or syntactic patterns have the tendency to strike the readers as uncommon and thereby engage their attention. Such a device is seen at work in Senna's poem. I will pronounce your name. See the first line of the poem. I will pronounce your name. Night. I will pray. I will pray you. Night. I will pronounce your name. Night. I will pray you. Night. Lines. Lines two, three, and four of the poem also continue with this form of foregrounding. With this form of foregrounding. Repeating, repeating the name Night, I'll pronounce your name Night, I'll be playing you Night. Night, your name is milled like cinnamon. It is the fragrance in which the lemon grove sleeps. Night, your name is the sugared clarity of blooming coffee trees. You can see how the word, the name Nahed keeps repeating in these verses. This is a good example of repetition as a kind of deviation. Now let us go to the genres of literature and their elements. When we talk about the genres of literature, we refer to typologies of creative writing based on form, outlook, structure, and to an extent purpose. And, and to an extent purpose. It is a common practice to classify literature into three main genres, which are also called the basic forms of literature. These include prose fiction, poetry, and drama. To begin with prose fiction as one of the three literary genres, prose fiction is the one that most resembles our conventional, everyday kind of storytelling activity. The writer of prose fiction basically narrates a story in a continuous form as any teller of folk tales or any narrator of an exciting event or record or episode 
The main instrument for presenting prose fiction is narration, and the person who writes the prose work may be the narrator of the story, telling the readers or the, audi the audience what happened, to whom, why it happened, and at what time it happened. Prose fiction is arguably the commonest and most patronized form of literature in the modern world. But it shares a lot with the story traditions of the ancient world, which comes in the form of myth, parables, romances, fables, folk tales, etc., and which are of which are of also narrative in form. Prose fiction is made up of the novel, the novella, and the short story. These three are what make these three are what make prose fiction, all of which are narrative in form. The novel is narrative, the novella is narrative, and the short story is narrative. The commonest among the forms of prose fiction is the novel, which is also the lengthiest of the three. Palmer defines it as a compact, coherent, and unified factious prose narrative having a beginning, middle, and an end. Palmer goes ahead to say that the novel deploys materials and information in such a way as to give the image of coherence, continuity, and wholeness, and certain tensions. We are done with prose fiction. Let us go to the second literary genre, poetry. What is poetry? Poetry is only is the only genre of literature that helps the writer to pour out his emotions and feelings. Good poetry has always been said to come from the soul and not from the head because it talks about very strong feelings coming from the inspired mind which may not find proper and appropriate expressions under ordinary less inspired situations. In his often quoted description of poetry which appears in the, in the preface to the lyrical ballads, William Wordsworth sees good poetry as the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings and strong emotions recollected in, a, in a tranquility. That's according to Abrams, 1981, page 115. Consider a situation where a woman sings a song of lament on the occasion of her dead husband's funeral. Wallace Inca writes the poems that gave birth to the collection, a shuttle in the crypt anger, pain and bitterness of incarceration during the Nigerian Biafra War. How is, how is language used in poetry? Language is the most distinctive factor in the poet's form. It is dense and concentrated, supercharged with meanings. For Chase and Korea, 1985, page 393, the main characteristics of poetry are verse, sound, and compression of statements. Moreover, for Chase and Korea, the careful and ingenious manipulation of the lines of a poetry rendition, taking into consideration the effects of the condition of the combination of and systematic variation in the flow of sound and the restriction of the amount of words to fewest possible guarantees good poetry. There are different forms of poetry like the epic, the elegy, the delge, the lyrical poem, pan pansegri poetry, occasional poetry, 
and solid. You need to note this. The knowledge of the different forms, of these different forms and traditions of poetry is very, very necessary to carry out a stylistic analysis of poetry. Let us look at drama. What is drama? As its meaning suggests, this is the most presentational, presentational of the three genres of literature. It is to be presented, it is to be acted for people. This is because while other forms of literature are essentially designed to convey their messages in words, Drama is designed to present its statements in a combination of action and words. In drama, characters assume life and act in the story of the play. This is why drama has been variously described as the genre of literature that is closest to life and that has the most immediate impact on the audience. The closeness one feels when one sees a story unfolds in one's very presence all performed by human beings like oneself is definitely greater than what one reads the same story in black and white. Even when plays are written in black and white, they are written with the intention of being eventually presented on stage. A play is therefore a work for an audience which gives it its spectators a close feeling that they are part of what is happening on the stage. There are three broad subgenres or types of drama. These are tragic, comet, and tragic comet. A tragic story should be one that ends so suddenly that the audience cannot help but feel pity for the characters for the misfortune they have suffered. And the tragic comment subgenre of drama was popularized by the prolific and extravagantly talented English dramatist and playwright William Shakespeare, who is also widely reputed as one of the world's greatest literary figures of all time. A comic play is a dramatic presentation that not only ends on a light-hearted note with no serious misfortune such as heart and death to the major characters, but is also designed to create an involve, and involve humor. In spite of the fact that comedy has been thought to have no social function, it has been proved that a comic play can teach moral lessons and make concrete sociopolitical and economic statements. Let's see the elements of prose. Prose has elements such as characters and characterization, plot, setting, theme, point of view, conflict, and language. It's important to note that prose fiction is characterized by such elements as characters, and characterization, plot, theme, setting, point of view, conflict, and language, as we've seen here. But of all the elements of prose, language is the most important because it is through language that other elements come into life. Let's look at the elements of poetry. Briefly, the elements of poetry include the persona, which means the voice we hear most of the times in poems and not always those of the poets. So the voice that speaks in a poem is what we refer to as the persona. It, may, it might be, in very rare cases, the voice of a poet, but the poet may use another, may use the voice of another person to present a particular issue in a poem. So the voice that speaks in a poem refers to the person. We have another element of poetry called the imagery. Imagery, as the term is difficult to describe with precision because of the way it is used loosely. In a broad sense, it can be used to describe any writing 
which is descriptive and helps the reader to visualize the scene and so to experience the poet's experience. We have both oral, oral and visual imagery. The other element is sound patterns that refer to rhythm, sound effects like onomatopoeia and alliteration, consonants, assonance and others. We have rhyme. This has to do with the recurring use of similar vowel sounds, especially at the end of the lines of a poem. Let's look at the elements of drama. Drama has elements such as plot, and plot is the sequential arrangement of events in a play. We have theme as an element of drama. This is the message of the play or what the play is all about. We have conflict. This is the bond of the contention between the, the protagonist and the antagonist. And we have characters or char and characterization as an element of drama. These refer to the agents responsible for actions and conflicts in play. These, the, the agents responsible for actions and conflicts in plays. These are characters. And we have language. The language of drama is the exchange means of communication method adopted in the play. And the language commonly used in drama is that of conversation or dialogue. And we have setting as an element of drama. This involves the location of the play. It may be divided into three, time, place, and atmosphere. Let us look as we are, as we as we go as we approach the end of our module. Let's see the basic terms, the basic terms in drama. We have cast. This is the list of actors and actresses given defined roles in drama by the playwright or director. We have playwright. A playwright is the writer of a piece of drama or play. Conflict. This involves the protagonist and the antagonist in their library and struggle for assertion of influence or relevance in a piece of drama. Another important term is protagonist, which refers to a character who plays the most prominent role in a play. The protagonist is also often referred to as the hero for men and heroine for women, or the chief character. We have antagonist as an important term in drama. He or she is the character in a play who opposes the protagonist rightly or wrongly. Often he or she contradicts the protagonist. The other important terminologies are like no, denouement, denouement. This is also known as the resolution or the unknotting of events. It is the resultant process soon after the climax has been reached. Here, the conflict in a play is finally resolved. We have catharsis, meaning purgation, purgation from page, pegation, from page, the original Greek word. It is the feeling by an audience of sense of release or the cleansing of the mind of excess motion, often through the shedding of tears as when a great tragedy is being played out in stage. Tragedy fraud is a, is a costly mistake made by the protagonist in a play or drama. It could also mean an inbuilt or inherited weakness, say pride, like in hubris, or hubris, pride or hubris, which aids the downfall of the protagonist. The tragic flaw in Hamlet, the character in Shakespeare's Hamlet, is indecision. So that is a kind of a mistake that is either inherited mm, or it is inbuilt that causes the protagonist to fall. 
We have dramatic iron. Dramatic iron is a situation in drama in which a character out of ignorance says or does something which ruins, which runs counter to the cause of action whose real outcome is known to the audience but the hidden but is hidden from the character in question. Suspense. This is the state of anxiety and expectation in the reader or audience of a play as to the likely outcome of events. It raises the reader's interest and keeps him or her guessing as to what will happen next. We have soliloc. Soliloc. It is a device in drama which allows a character to engage in a loud self-talk which enables the reader or audience to have access to what is in his or her mind. Product. This is the formal introduction to the play written in prose or verse whose content is relevant to the unfolding events in the play. This device is used in all our protimies the gods are not to blame. The prologue is the formal introduction to a play written in, pre in prose or verse whose content is relevant to the unfolding events in the play. This device is used in all our protimies. The gods are not to blame. Then we have another important term in the drama called epilogue. This is the closing comment in a play which justifies an area cause of action or fills an untreated gap. The device is used in the rivals. Who is the author of the rivals? I assign you to go and find the author of the rivals. We have another important term Related to the concept of drama is chorus. What is chorus? It is a couple of a band of people in a play who takes in upon themselves as a group to comment on the preceding of dramatic actions. The group sheds light on the unfolding events and prepares the audience for what is to follow. Then we have flashback. This is a literal technique involving the recalling of an earlier scene action or scene action or event which sheds further light on what is currently happening. Wolesoinka is fond of using this technique, flashback. Another important term in drama is director. The director is the theatre artist who directs the speech movement and actions of the actors and the actresses in the interpretation of the different characters in the play. In the play. Then we have producer. The producer in steady drama, this refers to the person or organization that brings the performance about and also funds it. And we have interlude. This is a brief performance which serves as an interval to a main performance. We have prompter. During a performance, the prompter is the person who stays out of sight to remind an actor or actress of lines which escape his or her memory to ensure the continuity of actions. And role play. Role play is also an important term. The playing of a specific role in a dramatic activity without fully transforming into character is what is called role play. This is different from acting, which involves a total transformation of the character. In role play, the personality of the performer fully dissolves into the role being played. Then the audition. This is the process by which actors and actresses are chosen for specific roles in a performance. This partly involves the reading of lines from the play 
to the hearing of the director. And we have climax. The climax of a play is the moment of greatest tension, when the conflict attains peak and is now fully ripe to be resolved. To conclude, the important dramatic elements include plot, theme, character or characterization, conflict, language insertion. A good mastery of these elements will enhance your stylistic analysis of any piece of drama. Again, we have emphasized that the drama exists in actions. It is performed. It is, a, it, is, it is performed literature. While other forms of literature may be personal, drama is social and it is the most collaborative form in the sense that it needs the service of many people to come to life on stage. This marks the end of module 5. May I Thank you for following me all the way through the first module, the second, the third, the fourth, and now the fifth. And I welcome you to follow me all the way through the next module. I'm Mr. Johanna John from the Open University of Tanzania. Thank you. Thank you very much.